Okay, so continue our discussion of file system. Um, what we talked about last time was just, you know, how do we manage file allocation? Remember, we had various ways of doing it, linked allocation, file allocation tables, which factors out the linking information into a specific location, but then that constrains the size of the um, devices that we can use. And then we started talking about indexed file allocation, which is a really great idea. The index is stored separately, so, and we can even put metadata in there. So if we have hard links, multiple hard links, they can all access the metadata for the file. So really great. That's why most modern operating systems use indexed allocation when they can because it makes the most sense. But we are all are, are kind of stuck with FAT32, especially now that UEFI uses FAT32. So everybody will have probably a FAT32 EFI partition uh, on their system whether or not they want to use it. Um, but, you know, most of these other file systems support much better ways of doing things. Now, um, so that's what we talked about last time. What we're going to do today is kind of go through a, a number of topics that are related to file systems, just to make sure that you've seen them because they are important for the, uh, the file system lab. Um, but one of these things is that we have a buffer, because remember that talking to the disk is slow. We'd like to avoid doing that. Even if it's a solid state drive, it's going to be pretty slow. We're talking what, like... Um, hundreds of thousands of clocks instead of millions of clocks if you're talking to a solid state drive. So um, the OS basically maintains this buffer. We talk about this in CS24 too, that this is, um, DRAM is a cache for the disk. And so basically the OS keeps this cache and a lot of times when you perform reads and writes you do them against this cache, not actually against the uh, disk itself. And so there's a lot of interesting issues surrounding this, uh, you know, using a, of a cache in the operating system. This is one of the reasons why, um, you know, when somebody turns off the power to their computer, it's likely they'll lose data because not all of the cache was actually flushed back to disk. So you need to shut down operating systems cleanly. Okay. Now, of course, multiple, multiple processes can have a file open at the same time, and that presents some interesting challenges. Uh, we may have processes reading and writing data on the same file, and so we need some way of coordinating that. Now, of course, we have the cache, and um, these are the kinds of things that you can run into if you don't have um, shared memory. I don't know if anybody even attempted doing shared memory in this lab. I kind of get the impression this year that nobody will have attempted that. We've had many teams attempt it successfully over the years. It's just this year I think uh, probably nobody's going to um, have the guts to try that. But you can imagine a situation in virtual memory where one process wants a page and so it faults on the page and now it's being loaded and you have some millions or hundreds of thousands of clocks to load the page and then some other process says, actually, I'd like that page too. So it also faults. And now it, the page fault handler has to be clever enough to say, oh, I'm already loading that page frame. So I need to just block this other process without doing all the things I already started. Same thing is true of the file system. One process wants to read a certain page of a file. OK, I'm going to start loading it into the operating system cache. Another process wants to access the same file, the same section maybe, and so the file system cache has to be clever enough to realize, okay, now there's two processes waiting on this. I've already started loading this. I don't want to start loading it twice and get into some really weird situation. So that's something you will have to actually think about, and so it's kind of nice that shared memory is not something you have to do in Project 5, because effectively you'll have to do something about shared memory in Project 6 um, through the file system cache. Okay, so the OSs uh, have to manage this problem, but there are a lot of different ways that they deal with this issue. So we're going to talk about some of the things that are done. Um, <clears throat> basically, if you're reading, you're all good. So if I have five processes trying to read a particular block, that's great. There's a few synchronization issues like the one I just mentioned. If you have five processes who all concurrently hit the same block at the same time and is being loaded into the file system cache, then I need to make sure that all five processes are blocked and I don't do anything weird and corrupt the uh, OS state. But basically, once that page is loaded, then everybody gets to have it. Okay. Now, if you have a read that occurs after a write, then we need to make sure the write is visible to the reader. And that's where we have to start thinking a little bit more carefully. 
And so the buffer page is typically you load the contents, then uh, subsequent reads, you know, you let the write go, and then the subsequent reads should see that written data. Now, um, we have this other thing that uh, the OS may decide to allow certain amounts of concurrency on writes. And this is where it becomes really weird because let's say that we have two processes writing to completely different sections of a file. Should we allow those things to occur concurrently or not? Linux says no. <laughs> so Linux is like, nope, no, you're not allowed to do this. Now, of course, this was back uh, in, you know, probably at least two years ago. So I don't know if Linux still prevents this, but uh, you have these situations where OSs have to make a decision about it. Concurrent writes to different parts of the file, as long as they're like in different disk blocks, is easy. Just let it go. In fact, that's something I think that you'll have to do for this uh, project six. You will have to allow um, concurrent writes to different parts of the file. Appending is where everything can go horribly wrong. Because you basically have to modify the metadata of the file, and then you have to modify the file itself. And you need to do this in a way that is correct even when people are trying to do this concurrently. Okay. So for example, I need to say, ooh, somebody is trying to extend the file to this size. Typically, operating systems are very generous, and you'll see this more in uh, the next project, that uh, I can seek wherever I want, as long as it's not negative. That doesn't make any sense. But if I seek, you know, let's say five megabytes past the end of my file, and then I perform a write, that should actually extend the file size out that much. So the file system is very generous in that if you try to write past the end of a file, it doesn't give you an error. It just extends the file size, so it just doesn't. So um, those kinds of situations you need to be very careful. And so um, a very easy approach for this kind of thing is that when the file's information is in the file system cache, which you can always Make that your first step when a file is being accessed. The file has to be opened anyway, so you'll have its metadata and other information in the file system cache. Then what you can do is you can have some kind of metadata lock, and you just always require that that metadata lock be acquired as part of appending to a file. Okay, so that's um, a very common approach for this kind of thing. The metadata has to change, so go ahead and require that the metadata lock has to be uh, acquired before I do this kind of thing. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, of course, another thing that you have to think about is truncating files. So um, another thing that you can do, for example, is uh, set a file size. <laughs> so when you want to change a file's size, then uh, that may also involve throwing away some of the file's data. Because if the file is 10 megabytes, and now I say that its size is 2 megabytes, I have 8 megabytes that should no longer be around. So that tends to be the way that file systems work. Two megabytes, the other eight megabytes are discarded. So you can see how truncation of, and appending both change file system metadata as well as, as uh, the actual file data itself. And so those kinds of things need to be managed very carefully. Okay, so um, that's something that you'll have to solve. We'll talk about that a lot more on Monday, I'm sure. So um, typically, operating systems provide APIs for governing concurrent access to files. So uh, I can acquire a lock on an entire file. Windows is very careful about this kind, kind of thing, curiously enough, um, given that it doesn't really allow multiple users uh, concurrently very well. So, um, but multiple processes it can definitely deal with. So uh, you can lock a file so that you're the only process that is allowed to interact with the file. And uh, so you can specify that kind of thing when you uh, try to create a file or try to open a file. Now, there's another technique called advisory file locking, which I don't like, because basically advisory file locking means it's participatory. You can choose to acquire locks, and then the OS will make sure that people who are choosing to acquire locks are blocked, but you don't have to acquire locks. So you can have nine processes playing nice, choosing to acquire locks on files, but then you have the one process who's like, I don't care. I'm just going to go do whatever. And they're not blocked by the operating system. The OS doesn't say, no, you're not allowed to do stuff because other people are acquiring locks. Okay? So that's kind of lame. But I do believe advisory file locking is what the, the Unix API specifies. 
So this is standard behavior, which is annoying. Okay. So uh, yeah, f flock or flock, but uh, I typically say f flock because it's not about birds, is uh, the function that you can use for acquiring and releasing advisory locks. Okay. And so, like I say here on the last point, if you decide to just write or read to a file that's been flocked, then it's going to let it go. Uh, even if it conflicts with uh, existing locks. So that's no good. But that is what is there. Okay, so um, there's also lock F, which is uh, great, um, great naming there. So uh, you can actually acquire and release advisory locks on portions of files. So you could use this if you wanted to implement, say, a database and acquire locks on particular data pages because you wanted to do something to them. Okay. Again, though, it's advisory. It's not really something that is... Uh, uh, imposed by the operating system. It's not going to really make sure that you do things well. Now, um, flock and lockf both actually use this function called fcontrol. I don't know, has anybody used fcontrol before? You have whether you know it or not, but fcontrol is actually like the I want to do anything possible to a file system kind of operation. You can use it to dupe. Uh, so dupe and dupe2 typically wrap fcontrol. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do as well. I want to do asynchronous I.O. Okay, you could use fcontrol for that. Um, I want to lock or unlock regions of files. Well, you can do that through fcontrol as well. There's a whole bunch of other things that fcontrol allows as well. And typically, since it's such a general purpose function, I believe that you can actually ask it if it can do various things. So it, um, it will tell you what it's capable of doing, and then you can decide if it's what you need. So fcontrol is sort of the general purpose hook that allows you to, to do a lot of these other things that are provided by the file system. Okay, now, you also, so advisory file locking is nice if everybody plays nice, but it certainly doesn't, you know, that's not a requirement. This is also why we have preemptive multitasking, because everybody doesn't play nice. Um, so you have a few operating systems that also provide mandatory file locking, which means that if a process decides to ignore file locks, it is denied the allowance to do whatever it is that it wanted to do. So Linux is an example where it has mandatory file locking, but this is not standard. Which, it's like, who cares? I think Linux is probably going to be around. I think it's catching on. So if you decide to implement something like this, I don't think anybody would squawk at you. Okay, so any questions about locking at this point? This is... Very high level discussion, I apologize for that, it's just what I have had the energy to prepare in the past. So, um, you know, for example, when you do your um, file system stuff for Pintos, uh, you'll have read and write. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. And basically, any locks that are held on a section of a file will be for the extent of that read or write call. Okay, once it's done, that's it. You basically, none of the tests... Um, do any higher level of locking than just I'm reading a file, I'm writing a file, and I expect certain concurrency guarantees. So basically all of your file locking stuff will be inside the OS file system management code uh, specifically. Okay? And we'll talk about how to implement some of that stuff uh, next time, like I said. Okay? Read-write locks become really helpful for managing your file system cache. And uh, if you have never implemented a read-write lock, I'll show you how to do that. Uh, next time. There's there's some really simple ways of doing it. Okay, so deletion. Um, straightforward in general, because we have this file system data structure, I just need to go and update it properly. So, um, you basically you have a directory entry, and remember the directory entry is a link from the directory structure to the actual file data, and now um, typically this will also include metadata, so we just need to remove that entry. <coughs> and, of course, we may have multiple hard links to the file, so typically there's a reference count of some kind saying, okay, now I only have four hard links to the file data, so it's not time to get rid of it yet. And maybe I have two processes who have the file open, so I can't delete it yet. And when all of those things hit zero, then I know it's okay to actually remove the file's data. So you can see this kind of implies that the file system needs to know what blocks are in use, and what blocks are free. So that it, if a new file is being created, it can say, okay, it's time to uh, allocate these blocks to hold this file's data, or when a file is being deleted, 
these are the blocks the file is using so they can now be freed. Now typically um, knowing what blocks the file is using is really easy because if <laughs> the file system can't keep track of it then you shouldn't be using it. Okay, So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different ways to record this information but there's a few good ones and so I wanted to just give you a really brief overview of this uh, this aspect of how file systems work. Um, like it says here, frequently this is called the free space list, but it may not be a list. It may be a bitmap. It may be some other data structure. Bitmaps are really great for this kind of thing. You got a little bit of experience using that for the swap stuff, but a lot of file systems use bitmaps because it's a very easy way of telling whether blocks are occupied or not. Because think about it, I mean at this level we just care if the block is occupied. We don't care what's in it. We don't care about how they all link together. We just need to know what blocks are available or unavailable for use. And so yeah, the FAT format, I think I might have mentioned this the last, last lecture, but typically you can just store like minus one for uh, the FAT entry to say this one is not in use. So there's some other value that you can use to say this FAT entry is not in use. Um, maybe it's zero. It's been so long since I worked with FAT file systems. It might be zero because typically remember that uh, FAT was created for floppy disks, which was where your operating system was stored. And when you shoved that floppy disk into the computer and turned it on, none of your files would be in sector zero because that's where the boot sector of the operating system is stored. So it may be that um, FAT entries are zero when they're unused. You'd have to check, but I think that's how it works. Okay, so simple approach. You have a bitmap. One bit per block. That's really easy. If the block is free, you could set the bit to one. And if the block is in use, you could set the bit to zero. Now, you could also do that the opposite way. So if a block is free, so it would basically be a, an in-use bitmap instead of a free bitmap. So if you want to find an available block, well, that's really easy. You just go hunt for the first one bit, in, you know, and that'll tell you what the first block is. What if you want to find the first 20 blocks? Well, that's also pretty easy because you can just go through your bitmap and look for a run of 21 bits. It turns out that it's not too hard to do this kind of thing. <coughs> I'm trying to remember exactly, but there's a number of algorithms that basically, um, oh yeah, I'll tell you why this is important. So there's a number of algorithms that people use where they basically generate bit masks that will allow them to identify if there is a range of bits that are one in a bitmap uh, if they scan it by words or D words or something like that. So there's some pretty clever algorithms. The reason why this is important is for everyone who's using a map, a Mac, because uh, the allocator, the, the allocator in the uh, Mac, Mac OS operating system actually is a bitmap allocator. And so you might need to have a chunk of memory that's a certain size and so it'll actually give you a, a number of contiguous blocks that add up to that size. And so it uses a bitmap and it has to scan it efficiently. Okay, now the bitmap takes space. Uh, again, we typically think about these things in virtual memory page sizes because uh, on most real operating systems, the virtual memory system and the file system are accessed in the same way. So basically everything is mapped in virtual memory in the uh, operating system. So thankfully we don't have to deal with that. I guess that's good. Um, so anyway, the uh, bitmap has to take up some space, so if you had a 4 kilobyte block and your uh, minimum unit of allocation on your file system was 4 kilobytes, then you could basically uh, access 128 megs of storage space in one block. So that's not bad. Um, clearly, if I want to have a 1 terabyte drive or something like that, I'm going to need a bunch of these blocks, uh, which I could either have contiguous or I could allow them to be spread out. So there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. Now like I see here, a one terabyte disk would require 8192 blocks, 32 megs of the space on the disk to actually record the free space bitmap. So this is why, you know, people sometimes get annoyed and I sometimes have friends who don't know anything about computers and they say, well, I bought a one terabyte disk, but then I formatted it and it said there's only 962 megabytes or gigabytes left. Well, maybe that's a lot of space to be missing. But, you know, something like that where they don't understand that managing the device, managing the storage on the device, takes some space and you lose that. That's just overhead of using the device. 
Now, like I said, this can either be in one place or you can have it spread out. And ext2, for example, takes blocks and divides them into groups. And each group is basically a collection of blocks that has a free block bitmap associated with that group of blocks. Okay? And so you just have multiple groups. And so that's pretty straightforward. As long as you know how to find those groups, you really don't have any issue. Now, another thing is, I mean, it's a free space list, so you could actually maintain a linked list. And so the file system somewhere has a pointer to the first, um, the first free block, and then the free block is basically completely unused. It's four kilobytes, or it's, it's a sector, but let's just assume that it's four kilobytes. Now it's got a pointer to the next free block, and we chain them all together. Okay. What do you think of this approach? Do you like this approach? Do you dislike it? What are, what are some problems with this approach? Slow. Why is it slow? What's it slow at? Okay. So if I want to free a block, I have to update the first block and or you know wherever the, the the pointer to the first block is stored on the disk and then I also have to update the block that I'm storing I could just shove it onto the the beginning of the the free list that's not horribly expensive it's two writes but there are some things that are horribly slow about this what would be horribly slow okay why would iterating through it be important? Remember some of these uh, operations that I talked about before, like extending the size of a file or something like that. What if I wanted to write out like 20 kilobytes of data? Yeah, basically, well, contiguous is really interesting. What order is this free block list? That's another big question. Ah, oh, right now it starts getting really horrible. So yeah, this is this is the kind of thing that um, makes this approach very unappealing. That this free block list, um, even though we can append to it, append to it, we always prepend because that's super fast. Um, you know, isn't hideously slow. Um, allocation is terrible. We don't know what order this thing is in. If we're on a spinning magnetic disk, then just hang up everything right now because you might as well give up. Um, you're going to have seeks like crazy traversing this free block list. That's terrible. Um, the other thing is if you want a bunch of blocks, well, you're still going to be seeking, but now you have no idea if they're contiguous. So fragmentation, data fragmentation becomes hor horrible with this kind of approach. So there's a way, though, that we can actually tweak this pretty straightforward. Yeah, so um, you notice that I say it wastes a lot of space in the free list. If you think about it, I've got four kilobytes, and I'm storing one value in it. Let's say it's a 64-bit value so that I can access lots of space. But um, now I've got eight bytes of 4,096 that I've, <laughs> I've used, and the rest of it is, is free. So what if, instead of just storing the pointer to the next free block, I store a whole bunch of free block addresses? I could even order them or something like that. And now I can actually be a lot more clever. Maybe I could even arrange these so it's not just a linked list, but maybe it's some tree structure so that I can go ahead and start organizing the free blocks and I can actually tell if I have contiguous free space or not. Okay. So you can see that there's ways of arranging this where this is actually not a horrific approach. Okay. Um, but anyway, you, this is the kind of thing you have to be clever about. I, I suppose nowadays we have the, the uh, <laughs> I don't know if it is a problem, but I was going to say it's a problem, that we have solid state drives. And if you have a solid state drive, the seek cost isn't visible. It's not obvious because seeking isn't expensive on a solid state drive. It's basically constant time. And so um, you might be tempted to make decisions that are terrible on magnetic disks that you wouldn't realize because you're using solid state drives. If you knew you were only using solid state, then that's fine. Um, but then there's still overhead in using a solid state drive, and you could actually mitigate that by clever uh, data structure design. Okay, so yeah, this still requires more space than the bitmap approach.
Um, it's really nice that you only have a one or a zero that you have to store. Um, that's super nice. And so, like I said, uh, ext2 and the, the family of ext2, uh, those file systems all use a bitmap. And uh, I can't remember what Windows uses, but uh, bitmaps are very, very nice for this kind of thing. Okay. Uh, other ways as well, you could record runs. See, if you had like a uh, this grouped uh, free list kind of thing where you have a free block and you use it to maintain some sophisticated data structure to keep track of um, available blocks, you could use that kind of thing to say, hey, this is a contiguous region of, let's say, 50 blocks starting at this block. You could actually organize those kinds of uh, records relatively easily on your on your file system and then maybe that would be really fast for doing allocation requests and so forth. So there's a couple of um, you know interesting benefits of having this kind of approach. Okay so that's basically all we talk about with deletion and so uh, one of the things that you notice about deletion and this is very interesting to me is that basically you don't have to touch the data blocks that you're deallocating. What do you touch? Well, you have to say this directory entry isn't in use anymore, so you clear the directory entry, maybe you remove it and coalesce, and then you just say, I have fewer directory entries now. There's some free space thing that says these blocks are now available to use, but what do you notice about the data blocks themselves that were in the file? Who wants to go and write to those? That's slow. So operating systems basically never do. When you delete a file, the contents of the old file data sticks around. Okay, we actually call this characteristic data remnants. And so when you delete stuff, you can't really guarantee that it's been deleted unless you are using a file system or a device driver or something like that that specifically says, when you delete stuff, I will make sure to overwrite it. And there's some algorithm where you overwrite it like seven times, I think, is the generally agreed upon number that makes data recovery virtually impossible or something like that. So um, there are ways to avoid data remnants if you need to be careful. Okay. I mean, it's, it's funny because you have like criminals who care about this kind of thing. And then you have humanitarians who care about this kind of thing. So it's like you're, you could be really naughty and care about data remnants, or you could be really nice. So if you're in some country that doesn't have very good human rights uh, records or something like that, and you want to try to report or something like that and get information shared, a lot of times those systems have ways of wiping them, and they want to do something that can't be recovered. So they, they uh, try to, uh, to um, be clever about this kind of thing. So anyway, data remnants is an important thing to think about in certain circumstances, but in general, most users, like I don't care because, I mean, I'm not that interesting, so you know, I don't care if somebody saw old data files on my computer. So, uh, you know, the operating system isn't going to do anything very careful to write over all this data because that's going to be slow, so it actually will leave that stuff around. Okay, so um, it is useful sometimes. I'm investigating a crime. I need to find if somebody has naughty files on their computer. You know, who knows, like, uh, you know, accounting information that I might need to know about or other details that would be helpful for prosecuting crimes. Or I just accidentally deleted my CS124 assignment and I'd like to be able to recover it. Things like that. So uh, it used to be that data um, undelete utilities were very common. It's much less common now because I think it's become harder to re... re uh, the, the problem is that you need the metadata back as well, and I think re reacquiring the metadata has become much more difficult given our uh, currently uh, used file system formats. Okay, so yeah, it's not, not difficult to solve this problem as well. You can certainly look for that. Just Google secure erase and, you, and you'll be fine on that. Okay, now um, I'm going to talk for the last section about um, solid state drives because um, one thing about solid state drives is you think, okay, data remnants. If I have a file on a solid state drive and I want to overwrite it before I delete it, this is an absolutely worthless thing to try to do. Okay? I have a solid state drive, I want to try to overwrite it before I delete it so that I know nobody can recover it. That won't work because of the way that solid state drives work. There are other approaches that you can use, but not that one. Okay? Um, so solid state drives definitely complicate things.
Um, they're block devices, just like hard disks, spinning metal hard disks, I mean. So um, reads and writes are a fixed size, some block size. They probably all emulate 512 byte sectors, just to be friendly. Um, but then, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you started to see 4 kilobyte uh, sector SSDs as well. So uh, I would expect, in fact, they'd be very common. Um, the problem is there's this magical, there's a couple of magical rules that make solid state drives really complicated. And one is that you can only write to blocks that are empty. Okay, so if the block is empty, I can write to it without doing anything else. If it's not empty, then I have to be more clever. Okay, so that's problem number one. The other problem is that I can't erase a block all by itself. We haven't gotten there yet. And the technology is easier to implement to allow you to erase a large chunk, or I should say a large number of blocks, which together are called an erase block, rather than erasing a block individually. Now, if this one problem was solved, all of the other stuff I'm going to talk about would become very easy. But the issue is that we have these erase blocks, which are much larger than an individual block. So you might have a 4 kilobyte or 8 kilobyte read-write block, but erase blocks often are 2 megabytes. This is one example. The number of drives that will have different sizes like this. Okay, so I write to a block. Now it's got data in it. I'd like to modify that portion of my file. What do I do? Okay, so uh, if you have empty blocks, that is what you use for subsequent writes. That one is pretty easy. But if I end up running out of blocks that are empty, then I need to start doing something clever to get more blocks that I can utilize. Okay? Um, as difficult as the file system is to write on Pintos, be glad you don't have to deal with this problem. Unfortunately, this is something that operating systems have to deal with now. Okay, so how do we even do this? Well, solid state drives um, have this thing called a flash translation layer. Because remember that we have logical block addresses, which, you know, if you have a storage device, the first sector or the first block is zero, and then the next one is one, and then the next one is two. So that makes it very easy to address any given block on the device. It used to be that we had cylinder head sector addressing, where you had some number of cylinders. Remember, the cylinders were all the tracks out at a certain distance from the center of the platter, and the cylinder was all the sectors that were above each other. So you'd have multiple layers, you know, all spinning. And so then you'd have head. Is it the head on top of the platter or the head below, or is it the next head or the next head or the next head and so forth? So that would tell you which platter and which side of the platter. And then the sector was, you know, the thing was divided uh, you know, in an, uh, you know, basically you'd have like nine or fifteen or something like that sec sectors around that track, and so cylinder head sector was very aware of the physical device structure, and that started working really badly when hard disks started doing things like having zones with different numbers of sectors out on the edge. I want to have many more zones, I mean many more sectors in my zone than I do on the inside because I can cram more more data in that space. So um, all of that was lame and gross, and so we switched to logical block addressing. And so the flash translation layer actually kind of has a simple job. It takes that logical block number and says, this is the cell in which that data is stored. <clears throat> now, I don't actually represent that here on the slide. You'll see that I have F1.1, F1.2, F1.3. That's file 1 the first block in the file, file one, the second block in the file, file one, the third block in the file. Somewhere the operating system knows logical block number to file. Okay, So it has to still keep that information, but I'm just representing that this flash translation layer is keeping track of where everything is. Okay, so when you write to the SSD, you have to make sure that you only write to the empty cells. So if I want to write to one of these cells, let's say that uh, I edit block 2 in file F1. I'm writing my disk code for the last project in, in CS124, and I hit Control-S because I have a, a nervous tick where I always hit Control-S when I'm writing code. Then I write to that block, but I don't actually modify the F1.2 block on the uh, storage device. I have to instead say that this thing is no longer in use, and I have to store the new version somewhere else, in some other empty block. And then I need to modify the flash translation layer to say, the second block of this file is now somewhere else. Okay, now, um, which part of this is the operating system involved in? 
It just says, hey, this logical block now changed to this content. It doesn't really care about all of this other stuff. All of this other stuff is handled by the solid state device. Okay? So um, we don't have to actually worry about managing the flash translation layer in software. That would suck. But you can see now this device is really clever. It, it has a lot of intelligence going on inside. Okay, so this happens. You keep writing code, you keep saving code, you keep running it, it keeps not working, so you keep writing more code. And you end up with a situation like this where a lot of blocks are old, they're not in use anymore, and so now I need to figure out where I can get some more free blocks so that I can actually write some more data. And so you can see that the solid state drive has some kind of periodic maintenance or reclaiming of old blocks that it has to be able to do. And so um, if I have a situation where all of the blocks in the erase block are old, no longer in use, I'm super happy. I just pull that switch and write, you know, clear all those blocks out. Switch them all back to unused. Okay. Remember that that's kind of the only operation I have available. I can't say that a single write block is no longer in use. I have to clear the entire erase block. Okay? Everybody with me? All right, so that's the easy case. And obviously, if the solid state device notices that all of the blocks in an erase block are empty, or I should say are, uh, contain old data, then it can go ahead and just do this on its own. Super easy, just automatically. Okay, so now, let's see. So I wrote uh, F2.1 again. So I was on F2.1 prime. Now I'm on F2.1 double prime, and I marked the F2.1 prime as old. It's no longer in use. Okay, so this is what your device is doing over time as you write to it. Now let's say that we have a situation where I... I'm getting uncomfortable with the number of write blocks or empty blocks that are available. So I, I want to go and try to reclaim some cells that are no longer in use. Okay, you can see that I have three more rows or three more erase blocks that I haven't quite done anything with. Um, but one has one block with old data, one has two blocks with old data, and the other one has one block with old data. So let's say that the solid state drive is trying to aggressively reclaim old cells, and we have a situation here where I decide I want to erase this erase block. Well, it still holds data, so I have to migrate that F3.1 prime and F3.4 prime somewhere else. Okay? This has to happen, and then I can erase this thing. So I started out with three available cells to write into, and now I have five available cells but I also incurred two additional writes. Okay. So you can see that this kind of thing has an interesting issue that starts to show up. This sometimes when I write to the solid state drive, it can't accept that write right away. It has to shuffle things around in order to make space for my write. So we call that write amplification. I say I want to do one write, and the drive is like, okay, I'll do 15 writes, and then I'll be able to handle your write. You sometimes have these kinds of situations occur. Okay, so we try to avoid this. Okay, does everybody understand write amplification? Maybe you've seen this before. Um, the issue that we have with this, <clears throat> okay, there's a couple of issues. I mentioned one here, which is that you can only do so many of these erase write cycles. Okay, then the cell basically becomes useless. This is how a solid state drive burns out. Uh, I was talking to somebody about this because they were kind of shocked. I can't remember. I think it might have been my ceramics instructor who's not a huge technology person, as you can probably imagine. He's done ceramics for 35 years. <laughs> and uh, he's much better at ceramics than I am, but uh, not at technology. So anyway, uh, you know, he was kind of shocked that these things wear out and they were kind of designed to wear out. And I told him, look, there's, and you probably may even be aware of this, there's people who got solid state drives and plugged them into computers and then basically just wrote random stuff to them and they've never stopped since they put them in to see how long will it take before that device fails. Kind of a, a helpful thing, I suppose, to know. Uh, I'm glad I'm not the one having to do that. And uh, these devices are designed to last at least five years, basically, if you have a very constant number of writes to them. Now, they'll probably last a lot longer um, unless, of course, the solid state drives controller burns out, in which case none of your data is available. So they have a much worse failure mode than hard disks typically have. 
Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, yeah, my heart just started acting up, so I put it in the freezer, got it really cold, and then I plugged it in my computer, read all the data off of it, and then threw it away or whatever, you know, those kinds of things. So there's really interesting things you can do with hard disks to recover information. Solid state drives, sorry, you need a soldering iron, and you may still not get your data back. Anyway, so that's, a, that's an aside. So um, how, does, how does the SSD know when a cell's contents are no longer needed? So this is a really important question. How do we know that a cell's contents are no longer needed? Think about what the operating system is doing to the solid state drive that allows the solid state drive to infer that it no longer needs a cell. The way that it can tell is because somebody performed a write to the same logical block address that is currently in use by some cell. That's the point where it says, okay, this cell is old. I don't need it anymore. Okay, everybody see that? So I have a write to a logical block. Okay, I'm going to store that somewhere on the device. Then I have another write to the logical block. Now I know that that old cell is no longer needed. I can mark it old. Okay, that's kind of important because when you delete files, <laughs> You don't want to write to the data because writing to disks is slow. So I just change metadata, I change indexing, I change the free space table, but I don't actually write to the data so the solid state drive doesn't know that blocks are now available that weren't before. As far as it knows, those things are still in use. Okay. So yeah, file F3 is deleted. So maybe some Metadata is modified, but the actual F3.1, 3.4, 3.2, 3.3 are kept because the SSD doesn't know. And so what can happen is that when the solid state drive is doing its reclaiming of cells, it will still think that those things are in use, so it will try to migrate them because it doesn't know. Okay. So this is the real trick that you have with solid state drives, and this is where trim comes into the uh, picture. Okay, uh, Trim is always written in caps. I shouldn't say always, but it seems that it's always written in caps, even though it's not an acronym. It actually is just a, uh, a command that you can send to the device. Okay. So um, basically, early stage solid state drives didn't have a trim command, and the user was basically out of luck because what would happen is write amplification would become worse and worse as files were no longer needed but the solid state drive thought they were and you'd have this amplification of writes occurring. So um, basically what the operating system can now do is say these files, you know, the data is no longer needed. You don't actually have to write to the data blocks, you just have to record that they're old now. So the OS can issue a trim command and say these things are no longer needed. So basically Trim is a hint that the file system can give to, or I should say the operating system can give to the device that these blocks are no longer necessary. Wasn't really important with spinning magnetic disks, suddenly became extremely important with solid state drives. Okay, any questions? All right, let me see what this last slide says because uh, I know we're, we're at time now. Um, yeah, so there's, uh, okay, so I don't know if this is still a thing because this was like two years ago, but trim wasn't a queued command. You actually had to issue a trim command like without anything else going on concurrently. So uh, you had to actually stop everything else you were doing to the drive, issue your trim command, and then you could start doing other things again. Um, which is pretty bad. Now, um, let's see. So thankfully this has been fixed, so there's now a queued version of trim. Uh, trim is now being supported on more and more operating systems. Uh, Mac OS was really annoying in that it didn't for a long time unless it was a drive that was sanctioned by Apple, um, which is really annoying. But uh, basically, trim support is getting more and more universal, so this issue has been going away. Okay, any questions? All right, so that's all we're going to talk about today. And like I said, Monday will probably be a how to write the Pintos file system uh, discussion. At a high level, of course, I'm not going to give you the code. And then Wednesday, if we have it, will be on file system journaling. So that's kind of the plan for the last two lectures. All right, we'll see you next time.